Go to Acts uh, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. How many of you guys like to, uh, you know, you kind of keep keepsakes? That's why they're called keepsakes, right? Anyone do that? You know, you have like maybe a baby picture or, or maybe, you know, this is kind of gross, but in like baby books, there's like, here's your first tooth you lost. It's kind of weird. Or, or little locklets of hair. People are like, what, what color was your hair? Um, as, as white blonde as possible uh, was my hair. It was curly and then everyone thought it was a girl. And so my mom shaved my hair and then it grew back uh, straight. Weird, true story. Um, and then I went to college, needed a quick haircut. Pablo down the hall gave me a $2 haircut and it never grew back. True story. Okay, I came across this, uh, I came across this keepsake, it's a certificate of baptism, just this last week. Um, on the 20th of April, 1986, I was baptized by a pastor named Mark O'Farrell uh, down in southwest um, Florida, where I grew up as a kid. And uh, we're, we're focusing on, on, on baptism, not for something that is just, oh, this is a distant memory, but all the baptism is uh, for us. And Acts 8 is this beautiful picture. I'm actually going to do this sermon from my, my personal uh, Bible. So I, I do my own devotions in Christian Standard Bible and uh, preach out of ESV. And the reason is, is because uh, I like to just read it in a little bit different, little bit different nuances as I go through it. And so if you have a Bible, we're going to look at the story of the Ethiopian official, or other people call him the eunuch. And this is going to probably be going to be uh, probably the simplest sermon I've ever given. Um, and you're like, yeah. And it's going to be like story time. Yeah. And it's going to be quick. So if you have your Bible, let's go through it together. Uh, this is Acts 8. We're starting at verse 26. And I'm just going to go through it and talk about it along the way. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. Some translations actually say it's a desert place that he went to. Now, as I sat on, on and was studying this, for whatever reason, this little destination kind of just flew off the page at me. And in some ways, it kind of, it kind of wrecked me. And so uh, I'm going to skip a few slides, Ian, so that you know. But it kind, of, uh, it kind of wrecked me as I was going through this passage because I was like, how many of us feel even at this moment like we're in a desert place? Like you're like, Man, I, I know that I live in the Pittsburgh area, but how in the world did I get here? Because you weren't born here, and you don't have family that's here. You were born someplace else, and you're like, I remember the days when. Or you live somewhere else, and then for whatever reason, the Spirit of God led you back to this place. And you might be like, I don't think it was the Spirit of God. It was my wife's family. Or it was a promotion. Or it was some other thing that was kind of random that brought you back to this place. And you might feel like this is a desert place. And yet it's not a desert place at all when we think about what the Lord says about this. And oftentimes we say, woe is me, instead of like, what is he actually up to? Check out this, this verse or this quote up on the screen from Charles Spurgeon. If the Lord should send us into the wilderness... We can depend that he will send somebody else there for us to bless. We can go, therefore, without fear. And just, just sit on that, that quote just for a second. Read that quote from where you are. Just sit on that for a second. God, why are you leading me to this place? Or why have you led me to this place? Or maybe you just took a new job. Or maybe you just had new neighbors that moved in. Most of my neighbors have been the same for years and years and years. But in the last just couple of years, um, there's kind of this turnover effect. And there's new people that are coming in. Now, now, if we're living at times like we feel like we're in a desert place, then why did God lead us here? And how is he going to use us while we are here? So let's continue on in this, in this passage. So he got up and went. He, obedience, right there. He got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of a Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. This eunuch was an official. We often think of a eunuch as being some like lowly person. No, this was a government official. And back in the day, uh, this whole story of this Ethiopian official is how the gospel spread to this man's land. It's amazing. He had come to worship in Jerusalem, but here they are in this desert place, and was sitting in his chariot on his way 
home. Reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The Spirit told Philip, now the Spirit had already, through the angel, told Philip, hey, go to that desert place. Now the Spirit tells him again, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? Now I want you to pay attention to this. This is the first of three questions that this Ethiopian man asked. First question. There's massive implications on this. Look at what he says in verse 31. How can I, he said, unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this from Isaiah. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. Now now the eunuch is there and he's reading this passage from Isaiah and he's kind of pondering. He's like, I don't get it. Who is he talking about? And Philip just happens to be in this desert place. Make note of this. Your life might at this moment feel very insignificant and purposeless at this moment. And yet God will and has led you into relationships with people all around you who it's easy to take your eyes off of saying, hey, there's a purpose on why we're connected. The purpose on why we're connected is we are, according to the scriptures, ambassadors of Christ. We don't live a life that's ours anymore. He bought us with a price the very blood of Jesus Christ. And this passage that the, that the eunuch, that this Ethiopian man was reading was about this Messiah. But he didn't know that yet. Look at verse 34, because it goes into the next question. The eunuch, this official from Ethiopia, said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this is about? Himself? Is he talking about himself, Isaiah? Or is he talking about someone else? Now, Philip could have answered in all sorts of different ways. But look at how he responded. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news, the gospel about Jesus, beginning with the scripture. He he, he went straight to the Old Testament. When, When we see in many places in the New Testament, by the way, when you see it talking about scripture, it's actually referring to the Old Testament. When he uses the word scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. Now, how do we know this? Well, first off, when this happened, the New Testament wasn't even written yet, okay? Um, But as he is going through this, he's explaining the story. And I'd imagine that he's going to what Jen Wilkin was talking about there in that promo. He's going back to Genesis and then Exodus and the promises and the covenant that was made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. There was going to be a people that God was going to bring to himself. He was going to deliver them to himself. But, but they would continue to rebel over and over and over again. No, 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 I don't, I don't want to believe in this God. I don't want to bow down to this God. I, I want it to be about me, or I want it to be more tangible. You know, in the Old Testament, when there's all sorts of idols that are there, and, and they bow down and worship these graven images, and, and yet the Scripture says in Exodus 20, hey, there shouldn't be any images before you. There shouldn't be any bowing down and, and worshiping to those images. I would imagine that Philip is going through the narrative of the Israelite people and explaining that they were hopeless. They had a king, David, and even before that, they had a King Saul. And yet, they weren't really the deliverers at all because they're still in the ground. And this story here that, that he was reading from Isaiah is talking about someone different, someone far above them. Look at verse 36. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? Now, if you look in your Bible, if you're using ESV or this CSB that I'm reading right now, you can see that there's verse 36, and you would think that there's a typo. Do you see it? Do you see it? When I study the Bible, I actually separate every verse out, and I was counting down the verses, and I'm like, wait, after 36 in my number system is 37. Still is. And right before 38 is 37. But in the Bible, guess what's missing? 37. Now, is that a typo? 
Does that make us be concerned about the, the, the authentic nature of Scripture? Actually, no. It should actually booster our confidence in it because the writers who were writing this down for us took notice for a second and said, hmm, many manuscripts have this 37, but others mm, don't really have this because Bible translations go from original manuscripts. They're not just one and then a translation of the one previous and the one before that. They all go back to the original manuscript. And so, so the scholars were, were, were reading and studying and writing down. And like, we're not 100% sure about this 37, so we're going to admit it. But guess what 37 and other manuscripts say? Philip said, now, now remember what, what he said in verse 36. As they were traveling down to the road, uh, they, came from, uh, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? That's his third question. And then 37 would say this in some manuscripts. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, let me say verse 37 again, because I don't have it on the screen. Okay, but let me read it again, because it's not in your Bibles. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, now you think about the, the authenticity of Scripture. Why in the world would you leave that verse out? That's like the epic verse of the entire passage. And yet the writers are like, we want to be 100% sure of what we put in here. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. That is everything in the favor of the gospel and of the church for that verse to be in there. And yet it's not. And so, so we know that, that, that Philip is talking about this Messiah that was prophesied around uh, 700 plus years before Jesus was actually born. Uh, that's when Isaiah was written. And so look what happened here in verse 38. So he ordered the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Now, now just catch that out. They went down into the water. This is one of the reasons why we believe in baptism by immersion. Uh, he didn't get out his little watering sprinkling thing and then like sprinkle over him or something like that. He didn't pour some over him as he was anointing him to be uh, like Paul or like Saul and David were anointed to be king. Uh, the scripture says he went into the water and, and they baptized him. Now, if you believe in, in infant baptism, it's a secondary doctrine, okay? We're not going to divide over that. This is a secondary thing. But I'm just telling you, this is why we believe in immersion. They went into the water and baptized him. And when they came up for, out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. I don't know what that was like. That was pretty awesome, though. And the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. He, he wasn't, like, worried about, where did that Philip go? That was a cool dude that just came by. Or how awesome was that that he was here and now he's gone? It, it wasn't anything like that. The, Philip was just gone. And he didn't worry about it. The, the eunuch, this Ethiopian official is like, I'm just rejoicing. There is a God and he's made me new and I'm now united with him. And that's the story that we see in Acts 8, right before Acts 9 when, when Saul is converted and, 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 and then starts to be known as Paul uh, to the Gentiles. Now, there's several things that I want to really like pop to the surface about this story. But um, look up on the screen to a few things. Discipleship involves, and this is what we get from Philip, okay, in this story. These three things, if you're taking notes, you definitely want to write them down. I think there's so much confusion about discipleship today. Man, if I just come along somebody and I just give them a hug regularly, is that discipleship? No. If you just tell your story about how you were a bad person and now you have better behavior, is that the gospel? No, that's not the gospel. Man, if I just go along with people and then I just give them money when they're in need, you know, and I help them, you know, and, and I just do all these good works, is that the gospel? That's not the gospel, and that's not discipleship. From this text, we see discipleship involves a go attitude and obedience. Philip heard the angel of the Lord. Hey, go down to that desert place. There was a go attitude. And my question for you as a people, as a church, do you have a go attitude when it comes to the good news of Jesus, even if it's in a desert place? Now, I want you to really think about that. Because I've seen a lot of people that have come into uh, churches that I've served in over the last 20 years and leave primarily for money and primarily for promotion. These aren't bad people. But the question is, where's the story of the gospel in this? 
Where's the story of a go and tell in this? Where's the story of Christ has made me new and, and I can't help but not tell other people about the story. We're a transient people, often for selfish and materialistic gain, not for gospel advancement. And, and what, I, what I love about this story is Philip gets up and goes in the middle of stinking nowhere. And his attitude is, if you say go, I'm going to go. And then discipleship involves this. This is huge, it's huge, it's huge, it's huge. And discipleship involves an open Bible. <laughs> that should be a no-brainer, right? But how many people are like, I, I, I want to tell people about Jesus, but I'm, I'm so biblically illiterate. The entire Bible, every single page is pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. The whole thing. When we go into Micah, you won't believe sin, judgment, Oh, it's epic. And then it ends with this beautiful story of God's kindness and his deliverance and faithfulness. It's going to be awesome. But discipleship always involves an open Bible, and discipleship involves questions and good news gospel answers. Always. Always. We are called, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, we talked about this last week. All authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus Christ, and he said, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or to obey everything that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. He's with us even now. There's joy in the house of the Lord because God is surely here. He's with us. But God, you're sending me to a desert place. I don't know what I'm going to do there. You know, at this, at this moment, I have no intentions of going anywhere from here. I don't, no intentions whatsoever. And people ask, hey, you know, you've, you've been pastor in this church for a long time, what, what would compel you to leave? Well, you're all family, I love you guys. But the thing that would compel me to leave is if the spirit of the Lord says, hey, you need to go because there's a greater gospel witness there. And I tell you, living most of my life in Pennsylvania, most of the world's gonna feel like a desert place to me. But, but if he calls, and then we have to be obedient. You're like, do you know something that I don't know? No, I don't know anything that I don't know. I'm just telling you a factor. I'm just telling you what goes through my mind often. We, we are called to be disciples. And with that, we also see in the story, and, and this is what the sheet is really about, that sheet that's uh, printed up there. There's four things on the sheet. You can, you can use this as a reference point. You can make notes on this because this is, this is where I'm going to end the sermon tonight. Are these four things that are on here? We get this from the story as well. Qualifi qualifications for baptism. Number one, that there's trust in the authority of Scripture. That God wrote a book, and this is his word. And he used people, all different people, uh, to write this 66-book Bible from three different continents, well over a 1,000 years apart, and yet they all seamlessly come together if you actually read it and study it. Most of the world looks and says, no, nah, I don't know that Bible. There's so many contradictions. Name them. You're like, I don't know that I can evangelize because I don't know what people are going to say. I don't know that I can disciple because I don't know enough. They can't name the contradictions. And if you open the Bible and you study it and you start to read them like books at a time, just entire books at a time. It doesn't take that long. Or listen to them. What did you say the other night in community group, Kevin? How many times have you gone through the Bible since your wife died? Just over a year ago, right? How many times have you gone through the Bible? Come on. Twice. Twice. How are you doing it? How are you doing it? How are you going through the Bible so much? I didn't even, I didn't even ask you about this, but I know. I just listened to my headphones. And, and he's like, am I retaining everything that's there? No. But man, the story's coming together more and more every time I go through it. Uh, we might not be readers, but we can be listeners. And some of you are like, I can't pay attention to anything when I'm listening. Um, some of us men have the, especially parents, have this great capacity to like tune out when chaos is around us. It's awesome. A anybody with me on that? We're not an amen church, but you can say amen on that one. Yeah, that's right. Come on now. But there's trust in the authority of Scripture that God wrote a book, and he, he wrote it for them in context, and he wrote it for us in context too. And so, so you, the first question you need to ask, if you haven't been baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ, do I believe in the authority of Scripture? The Ethiopian official did. He did. He's like, yeah, this is what it says. Oh, man, this, this, this Isaiah, man, he's talking about someone. That leads into the second thing. is an understanding of Jesus' victory. 
The gospel is not about you being a better person. It's about you being a dead person to your flesh because all the life that is ours comes from Christ. The victory has already been ours. Jesus was anointed. That means Messiah. He's the anointed one, the Messiah. He came. His life was a work of atonement. That big word means that he was making one, at one meant, the state of being one with all of creation. And baptism, like I talked about last week, is, is union with Christ and union with his church. It's a double whammy in baptism. And so there's an understanding of Jesus' victory on our behalf. He is the Messiah. I can't make myself good enough for the approval of God. So Jesus on the cross took the wrath of sin that we deserved, the wrath that his bride deserved. He took it upon himself. And all who were in Christ are now wearing robes of white. When Jesus comes back as the judge and he looks at you, and he looks at you, and he looks at you, and he looks at me, he doesn't see my sin anymore. Praise the Lord. Because how can I stand with my sin? I can't, and neither can you. And so the price that Jesus paid on the cross, he took our sin. He took the penalty that we deserved. And when he said in his dying breath, it is finished, and he breathed his last, the work was done. This is not about you becoming a better person. This is not about your behavior. This is not about anything like that. This is about we needed a Savior. And Jesus came as the one and only Savior. That's why he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And then there was a desire, a desire after reading this. Number three, the desire of the eunuch, of this Ethiopian official, of a faithful following of Christ. Listen, how many of you have experienced good times in life? Man, this is great. Everything's going my way. It's awesome. And then you woke up from the dream, right? And it was like, no, 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 this is hard. And, 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 and the days are uncertain, and, and I feel over, overwhelmed, and I feel hopeless. And the follower of Jesus Christ, the disciple, the Christ follower, Christian literally means like, like little Christ. The desire of someone who's being baptized, just like this Ethiopian man, was I want to follow him. Regardless of what happens, I want to follow him. Some people give evidence of following Christ, and then the sun comes. It's a parable. The sun comes down, and, and it's, it scorches what looked like growth. It, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a true uh, salvation. It wasn't a true desire to follow him. We know that we're followers of Christ when temptations come our way and trials come our way and we still stand firm and still believe that he's Lord and he's on the throne. We acknowledge him. And number four, hints of new life, new creation. Hints of new life, a new creation. This is the hardest one out of all of them to understand. And I don't know how Philip kind of, kind of qualified that with this, with this Ethiopian ruler. I don't know how he did it. But we see evidence through the rest of Scripture about this. And this is big. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about all who are in Christ. You're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. John 3 says, yeah, if you're going to have this inheritance within the kingdom, if you're, if you're going to be a part of, of this kingdom, John 3, Jesus says you must be born again. There's a, there's, there's a baptism of the Spirit. That's conversion. You're made new. This happens at a soul level. And it doesn't all come as once. It happens, and then there's gradual change into the likeness of Jesus. But are there hints of repentance? Are there hints of new life? Are there hints of being made new? Is there a hint of, I want to follow this Jesus? And it's the little subtle things. To all of you who are adults here tonight, if you've never been baptized as a follower of Jesus, the scriptures are clear. Be baptized. Repent of your sins. Be baptized. For those of you who are parents, if you're like, I don't know if my child is ready for that, um, the scriptures are clear on that as well. I don't, I don't know of a more simple passage to go to to talk about this. And, and we've given different resources. We sent out an email this past week, uh, resources that are there. Uh, there's this one that I just went through. Uh, this one here, we'll have copies in the back, and they'll be there as well. This is it's kind of our views of, of baptism and then communion. Scripture kind of gives us an order of that. It's seamless. It goes together. 
But would you pray about this? This is, uh, by the way, we don't, we don't keep a tally sheet and be like, oh, in 2021, there were six baptisms. And that's, that's 300% more than 2020. Uh, we don't do that. Listen, 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 listen. God knows his people. He knows his church. He's made us white. He calls us to obedience. And the reason why we're talking about baptism is for that. And we'll talk about it more into the future. We'll do different basic one-on-one series like this. Talk about worship uh, next year. We'll talk about, hey, what, what, is, what does it mean to actually come together and worship? And is it okay to clap? Yes, it's okay to clap. Is it okay to raise your hands? Yes. But if you clap, you better be on beat, okay? That's all I got to say about that, all right? Um, it's not the reason why we put in the headphones, but, but it helps, okay? Uh, and, and, and so what does it mean? Why, you know, David danced before the Lord. Yeah, yeah. All of these responses is God has done something within me that I can't explain. But look at the Ethiopian at the end of this passage. He was rejoicing. Because there was a peace that came within him. And this peace is not what the world offers. Heavenly Father, as we uh, continue on in our worship together, can we just acknowledge as a people that we need you? There's no one, no one like you. And although there might be confusion about what good news actually is and what this gospel actually is, There's no confusion in the fact that Jesus literally came to earth, literally lived a perfect life, literally went to the cross, displaying in the physical realm, but embarrassing everything out of the rulers, the prince of the air, and all of his demonic forces, embarrass him like crazy. They thought they won. And yet on the third day, Christ rose from the dead. And then after a time on earth, ascended. And is now at the right hand of you and all authority. God, I pray that this message would be clear to us and that we would be a people who are obedient. Obedient and, and longing to know you more. And taking steps of baptism is what your word calls us to. May we be a people who are known for repentance for baptism, for obedience, for community, for love, for unity, for grace, for joy, for love, regardless of the highs or the lows. And may we go out of our way for people who are not like us, people that we see in the schools and in the workplaces and in our neighborhoods. And may we be a voice of truth and not ones that hide within our homes. You've given us a mission and may we be obedient to that mission as we declare your love and grace and purpose in Jesus' name.